Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Welcome to everyone, a particular welcome to any guests who may be with us and to those joining us via live stream. May the Lord be with us and bless our worship to the strengthening of our faith and the glory of his name. There is one announcement this afternoon, and that is that the Lord's Supper will be celebrated among us next week in the morning worship service, the Lord willing. So we are all asked to prepare ourselves for that sacrament. Let us now lift up our hearts to the Lord and listen to this call to worship from Psalm 65. Praise is due you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. Brothers and sisters, from where does your help come? Amen. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let us sing our praise to the Lord with Psalm 108, stanzas 3, 4, and 5. Let us join together in prayer and ask the Lord to bless our worship. 
O Lord, King on high, throned on cherubim, may the peoples of this earth quake and earth's foundations shake when you in Zion, among your people, show your majesty, when you show your exaltation over every nation. Father, it is our privilege, our joy to spread the fame of your awesome name. Holy is the Lord, and you are to be adored. We praise you, our King. We sing of your justice. We worship you with upright hearts as your Spirit leads us. You, our King, you are mighty. Lord God, we thank you that you maintain right and truth and equity. You are a God of justice. At your footstool, your people bow and revere you. So we praise you, all of us, for the Lord, you are our God, you are holy. Father, we thank you for gathering us a second time to exalt your name, to sing your praise, to give thought to you, to who you are, to all that you have done for us and all that you have planned for us, a future so great, so bright, so beautiful to ponder, a beautiful future with you on the earth renewed, where earth and heaven come together, where all the occupants of heaven, the holy angels, the departed saints, and you, our triune God, all the occupants of heaven will be with us on the earth to enjoy life forever in holy fellowship and communion. Lord, we wait for that day. We are eager for that day. May it come quickly. In the meantime, then, we pray that you would keep us going in faith, and we pray that you would help us to understand the means by which you help to keep us going. The preaching of your word is one of those means. The sacraments is another one of those means. Next Sunday, we hope to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's a holy meal of communion and fellowship in which we may taste by faith the body and blood of our Savior and be united with him in a, a close, spiritual, very real way. Help us to prepare for that. Help us to examine ourselves in the week that lies ahead and to be ready to partake in faith and so be blessed and benefit from the sacrament. We thank you, too, for the gift of prayer, something we hope to speak about in the preaching this afternoon as your word teaches us to call upon you in prayer, even as we are doing at this very moment. Lord, we pray that you would guide us by your spirit to understand prayer better more clearly, more fully, and help us to put into practice the prayer you want us, the kinds of prayers you want us to be offering to you. Lord, we admit and confess that prayers and our prayer life can be a struggle. We're not always so good at it, and we wrestle sometimes with the things we, have, we, we should be talking to you about. And so we pray for insight, for wisdom, for guidance. Bless us, Father, in all these ways to the honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's open the scriptures to the book of Daniel in the first place. As mentioned in the prayer, we're going to be dealing with the subject matter of prayer by way of the Heidelberg Catechism. In Lord's Day 45, we come to the topic of prayer after having finished the Ten Commandments. So in Daniel 9, in the Pew Bible, page 947, 947, we have a prayer offered by this servant of God, and we have a, another example of prayer in Colossians 1. So we'll read both those passages at this time, Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, 
In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame, as at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us. Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquity of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. While I was still speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out. And I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. The angel goes on to explain the vision, but we're going to move on to Colossians chapter 1, page 1251 in the Pew Bible. We'll read the first 23 verses of this chapter. And notice that Paul offers prayer at a certain point to God for the Colossians. 
Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossa, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So far the reading of God's Word. Let's now sing one of the many prayers in the book of Psalms as a way to introduce the topic of prayer, we'll sing Psalm 142, a psalm and a prayer of David.
I invite you to turn with me in the Book of Praise to page 559, 559, where we will take up the subject of prayer taught us in Scripture and summarized by the church here in this Lord's Day 45. And I just want to hook into the last part of 44 for a moment, top of the page of 559. So that's at the tail end of the Ten Commandments. Second, so that while praying to God for the grace of the Holy Spirit, we may never stop striving to be renewed more and more after God's image until after this life we reach the goal of perfection. And then Lord's Day 45. Why is prayer necessary for Christians? Because prayer is the most important part of the thankfulness which God requires of us. Moreover, God will give his grace and the Holy Spirit only to those who constantly and with heartfelt longing ask him for these gifts and thank him for them. What belongs to a prayer which pleases God and is heard by him? First, we must, from the heart, call upon the one true God only, who has revealed himself in his word for all that he has commanded us to pray. Second, we must thoroughly know our need and misery so that we may humble ourselves before God. Third, we must rest on this firm foundation that although we do not deserve it, God will certainly hear our prayer for the sake of Christ our Lord, as he has promised us in his word. What has God commanded us to ask of him? All the things we need for body and soul, as included in the prayer which Christ our Lord himself taught us. What is the Lord's prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's our Heidelberg Catechism introducing to us the topic of prayer. In response to the preaching of the gospel, we'll sing about the work of the Lord Jesus who is in heaven even as we speak at the right hand of his Father where he mediates for us and perfects our prayers as our mediator. We'll sing all the stanzas of hymn 42. Brothers and sisters, in our Lord Jesus Christ, as we noted, the end of Lord's Day 44 already introduces the subject of prayer. There's a very tight connection between the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and prayer, for the simple fact of life is that we cannot we cannot hope to obey those commandments of God unless God helps us. And to receive God's help to live in obedience to God's commandments, God says to us, ask me for that help. Pray to me for what you need and I will give you what you need in abundance. So prayer becomes the starting point for our Christian walk of life, which is one of the reasons why Lord's Day 45 describes prayer as the most important part of our thankfulness which God requires of it. Take prayer away and our obedience to the law goes down the drain. Prayer is really the, the barometer or the measuring rod of our faith. Tell me how often you pray. Tell me something about the quality of your prayers. Tell me the content of your prayers, and I'll be able to tell you how your walk with the Lord is going. If your prayer life is poor, so will your walk 
with the Lord be poor. They're intricately connected. After all, if you don't talk much to someone whom you say you love, and we all say that we love God, right? If you don't talk to God much, who's accessible to you and to me, if you don't open your heart to God, how much do you really love the Lord? So prayer, it's, it's foundational, it's critical to life with Christ, to faith. And yet, many of us who accept that, many of us still struggle, don't we? Prayer leaves us with questions so many times. Does God hear my prayer? Does he really care about my little life? And there are times, too, when we enter into a circumstance of trouble, something that bothers us so badly that we don't know what to say, we don't even know how to bring it forward to God, don't know what to pray for. At other times, we hardly dare to come to God in prayer because we feel the weight of our guilt before God. A sin that we had just asked for forgiveness the night before, before 24 hours has gone by, we find ourselves doing it again. And the guilt piles up and our conscience afflicts us and we say to ourselves, how can I face God? How can I go back to God in prayer when I just blew it again? And on top of all those things, how often are we unsure whether or not God actually hears and answers prayer? How do I know that God will act when I ask him for help? Well, we hope to answer some of these questions as I bring you this word of the Lord this afternoon under this theme, to always be heard. Follow God's recipe for your prayer. To always be heard, follow God's recipe for prayer. We are to do three things. Mind your manner, mind your words, and always mind your Savior. Prayer, in one sense, can be compared to cooking. I'm going to try to work with a cooking analogy this afternoon. And as every cook here will know, for the dish that you're working on to turn out well, you need to follow the right recipe. A recipe tells you the right ingredients to put into it. It tells you when to mix what with what other thing and in just the right manner to do it, and then the meal turns out right. And while the cookbook will tell you how to make delicious meals, the, the book of Holy Scripture tells us how to offer prayers which God will acknowledge, prayers which are always heard and answered by the Lord. And the first ingredient starts with our approach, our manner in coming to God. The Catechism puts us onto that in answer 117. What belongs to a prayer which pleases God and is heard by God? First, we must, from the heart, call upon the one true God only. From the heart, not everything we say to God, not every prayer makes it to heaven's door. It's got to come from the heart. Words alone do not guarantee access to the throne. You can be the most eloquent speaker. You can have the most moving prayer where, where people thereafter are like, whoa, I was so moved by your prayer. But if the words do not come out of your heart, they're going nowhere. They're just wasted breath. That also means that prayers made in haste, without thought, are equally useless. Do you ever have that? Where you find yourself just kind of racing through prayer to kind of, because you've got to get somewhere, finish off this prayer at supper time because we have to get out to whatever. 
Or have you caught yourself daydreaming in the middle of your prayer? You start off talking to the Lord, and next thing you know, your thoughts are going. That's an awful feeling, isn't it? Here we are speaking to the Almighty, to the God we, we admire and respect and love. And all of a sudden, our minds are wandering. Maybe our, tra our prayers trail off altogether. Or worse, sometimes we might even fall asleep during our prayers, particularly if we are praying at night. Maybe that's happened to you. It's happened to me. And I think we feel the shame of it, right? There's other problems with our prayers. Sometimes our prayers can be brutally repetitive or monotonous. Now, it's true, of course, on the one hand, we need to ask God for the same needs on a daily basis because we have these needs on a daily basis. Think of all these petitions in the Lord's Prayer, like we have to ask God to forgive us our sins every day. We have to ask God to provide our food every day. These are daily needs. But when we give in to using identical <coughs> phrases in virtually every prayer, kind of a copycat prayer, maybe even the same prayer at the beginning or the end of our meals or at other times, we come dangerously close to emptying our words of meaning, to thoughtlessly calling upon God. Think about that for a minute. Are your prayers in your home so predictable that your kids or your spouse can finish your sentences? Do you perhaps use exclusively one particular name for God and then use it repeatedly in your prayer, like the name Father, Father this, Father that, Father, 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 Lord, Lord this and Lord that, and Lord, 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 Lord. God's name shouldn't be used as a stopgap if you lead prayer at home or in a group, ask someone who, who listens to you regularly. Just ask them. Say, look, I, I, I want to learn. How, is, how, how are my prayers coming across? Do you, are they repetitive? Am I doing things that are thoughtless or maybe potentially disrespectful to the God? How can I improve the prayer so that the prayer is fresh for all of us, so that it's meaningful for all of us each time? If we don't, that's how we end up with dead formalism, where we're just going through the motions, but the heart's not in it. That's how our spouse and our kids can easily tune out during dinnertime prayers, only to tune in when our voice goes in that certain cadence toward the amen. They can always predict when the amen's coming. We have to be real. Prayer has to come from the heart, whether it's as individuals or couples or families or congregation. We've got to think it. We've got to feel it. We've got to believe it. A very practical way to ensure that our minds don't wander is to pray when we have the most energy, when we are the, the freshest, like at the beginning of the day. Think of how the Lord Jesus would rise early in the morning. We read that in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. It was his habit to rise early in the morning and to spend time in prayer. Then the danger to fall asleep won't be nearly as great. It sets also the tone and the focus for our day, much more so than sleeping in until the, that alarm goes off at the last possible second and you've hit snooze three times and you run out the door at the last minute, maybe grab a coffee and a bagel at the coffee shop on the way into work. Rush, 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 rush. We can do this differently. Set that alarm a little earlier. Start the day with the Lord in prayer. What a difference it'll make. And when you pray at nighttime, and that's another time of day commended in Scripture, David did it lots of times, then maybe we're better off not praying lying down on our beds, but on our knees beside our beds. That helps us to stay more alert, gives us that humble posture. Remember Daniel. We read Daniel's prayer in chapter 9 of his book. His practice was to kneel in prayer three times each day 
with an open window toward Jerusalem. He would call upon God that way. And when Daniel prayed, Daniel, it was never about a show for Daniel. He understood his own standing before God. He understood his own sinfulness. For that's the other important part of our manner in approaching God. We have to approach him from the heart, and we have to approach him with an attitude of humility. Can be no pride there, can be no boasting, can be no arrogance. We have to humbly recognize our own sins. That's what Daniel does, very much so in chapter 9, which we read. You'll remember that Daniel is here in Babylon. He's been part of the exiles shipped off to Babylon. Immediately after addressing God and, and praising him, the very next thing Daniel does is to confess his sin and that of the, the covenant people. Verse 5, we have sinned. We have done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside for your, from your commandments and rules. We have not listened, says Daniel, to your servants, the prophets. We even read that along with the prayer, Daniel fasted and he put on sackcloth and he put on ashes. This was real for him. It's good to think for a moment about how humility and holiness go together. Sometimes people wonder about that and struggle with that. How on the one hand, we are to acknowledge our sin and misery, to own up to our depravity, but on the other hand, to hear from the Bible that we are, we're designated holy. We're called saints. We are called to be holy. So sometimes we can have this question, what, what is it now? Are, are, are we sinners or are we saints? Well, the answer from the scriptures, brothers and sisters, is we're both. Both conditions are true of us and of all believers at all times on this earth, in this life. By nature, simply as a human, I'm a sinner. And becoming a Christian doesn't make all the sin in my heart evaporate. I am a sinner in need of daily renewal, daily forgiveness. That's why the Lord Jesus commands us to pray, Father, forgive us our debts. But that's not the whole story, because by God's grace, as a gift to me in Christ, I also have been granted a new nature as a believer, as a Christian. The Holy Spirit is living in you and me from the day of Pentecost. And that new nature is slowly but surely taking over the old nature. It's conquering the old nature. It's transforming us into the image of God bit by bit. Lord's Day 44 talks about that. There's growth. So on the one hand, my sinful nature is, is reason for constant humility before God and will be till I die. But on the other hand, my new nature is cause for great thanksgiving and rejoicing as God's Spirit makes me live that holy life and puts to death that old nature more and more. So we are, as Luther would have said, we are justified sinners. That makes us humble saints, lowly but holy, and in Christ striving to gain and grow in holiness. All of that helps us to mind our manner, our approach, and that's really the first main ingredient in the prayer that is heard by God. And with our manner, we must also learn to mind what we say. For even when we are careful with the approach to our Father in heaven and have a humble heart, we struggle at times to know what to say, don't we? We, are, we struggle to know what to request, what's right, and if we are unsure what to ask of God, that makes us unsure whether God will actually give us what we ask. And that's frustrating. The Catechism points out that what we say in prayer is indeed very important. Answer 117. First, we must from the heart call upon the one true God who has revealed himself in his word. Here it comes. For all that he has commanded us to pray. For all that he has commanded us to ask of him. God isn't just going to accept anything we throw at him. Prayer can be rejected by God simply by the words we bring. 
Think, for example, of that self-righteous Pharisee. Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, I think. The self-righteous Pharisee, this was a, a parable told by the Lord Jesus. He came into the temple. Not only did he have the wrong manner, not only was he arrogant, but he also very much had the wrong words. All he did in his prayer was to tell God how good he was. He said, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers and evildoers, adulterers, or even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. A prayer like that is not heard. We should be under no illusions. The simple rule of Scripture is this. The content of our prayer needs to match the content of God's Word. That's why the Catechism highlights that we call upon God who has revealed Himself in His Word for all that He has commanded us to pray. From God's Word, we know that we have to address only God in prayer. We don't pray to saints. We don't pray to so-called other gods. We don't pray to whatever higher power we address the Father or the Son or the triune God and Him alone. We address Him in the manner that He prescribes in Scripture. Humble and heartfelt, faith. And then we speak to Him with the words and the ideas and the concepts that He wants us to bring to Him. Prayer is not to be a stream of consciousness simply arising out of our, our heart without any direction from our mind. That might be okay in yoga, but that's not prayer. You don't just say anything to the creator of heaven and earth. No. What the Lord says to us in his word is to be the guide and, and the measuring stick by which we speak back to the Lord. That's, that's the, the guidance and the process. Take all of God's commands, take all of God's promises, take all that God has revealed, and turn that around and let them form the content of your prayers. The content of the Bible is summed up rather amazingly in the Lord's Prayer. That's why the Catechism will spend the next seven Lord's Days explaining and expounding this prayer taught us by Jesus. For it's not just a prayer, it's, it's meant to be a model for our prayers. In it, the Lord gives us the basic outline, the basic content, just as uh, our Catechism says in answer 118, what has God commanded us to ask of Him? All the things we need for body and soul as included in the prayer Christ our Lord Himself taught us. Now, over the next number of weeks, God willing, we hope to be looking at each one of the parts of the Lord's Prayer, but this afternoon, I just want to summarize for a few moments the elements, the elements of the Lord's Prayer I want to summarize them with a simple acronym, the acronym ACTIP, A-C-T-I-P, ACTIP. And we'll see that the two prayers that we read, Daniel and Paul's prayers, both have these five elements in them, as does the Lord's Prayer. ACTIP, the first letter is A, A stands for adoration. Prayer should always be giving praise, or at least on a on a very regular basis, giving praise and adoration to God. Think of the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be your name. Daniel began his prayer that way. O oh Lord, he said, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. That's straight up praise. There's, there's no request in there. He exalts and hallows God's name. He describes his person and God's actions, and he does so in glorious terms. The Apostle Paul does the same in Colossians 1, speaking of, of Christ. 
He is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him, through him, and for him. I wonder, brothers and sisters, how much time we spend giving praise, just straight up praise to God, in our prayers. Is it the case that after a short address, we typically jump into requests? Father in heaven, be with so and so, or help me with this. Adoration is actually the goal of our life, isn't it? We were placed on planet Earth. We were created to be for the praise of our God. That's why it's the first petition in the Lord's Prayer. And if we start our prayers, if we have that habit of starting our prayers with praising God, that will help keep the focus off of ourselves and, and keep the focus on the Lord where it belongs. And then all our needs, which we certainly can bring to God in prayer, they will, they will be seen in the light of God's glory. After we spend some time adoring God, it's fitting at some point in our prayer to confess our sins. That's the C of Actip. Think of the fifth petition in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. We've seen how Daniel admitted his sins and those of his people. He holds nothing back in this regard. He lays it all bare before the Lord. Verse 11 of chapter 9, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside refusing to obey your voice and the curse and the oath that are written in the law of Moses the servant of God have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against you he admits his wrongs his failings his shortfall he declares the Lord to be just in his actions also his punishments over the church and then he seeks forgiveness I wonder, beloved, if we sometimes jump too fast to that last part where we're looking for forgiveness but haven't maybe spent enough time confronting ourselves with the guilt of our sin. Prayer that is heard by God, it reflects a humble heart that doesn't bypass its sin, doesn't generalize sin, doesn't ignore it, but faces up to it square on, identifies it, admits it, you know, the more specific we can be, the better it will be. Also, when it comes time to fight against those sins, then we have it in our, in our mind, and we can pray for the Spirit to work in us to fight this specific sin. It's harder to fight general sin. So name your sins. Name your struggles. You'll be forgiven, and you'll be renewed to fight against those sins. And along with adoration and confession should then at some point come thanksgiving, heartfelt thanksgiving. That's the T in act tip. Thankful to God for all that he's done. Here too, thanking God is an explicit recognition that all that we have, all that we are, is not because of our own abilities or our own smarts or our own ingenuity, we didn't build up our families or our possessions or businesses or reputations by our own strength or wisdom or whatever else. We recognize by thanking God, it comes from God. It's gifts. These are gifts from Him. It's God who blesses us with whatever abilities and opportunities we have. And as we exercise our gifts, it's God who blesses the use of our gifts so that we in turn receive physical blessings besides. Paul emphasizes that in Colossians 1. We always thank God, he says, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. You Colossians, you Colossians, you have so much and you do so much in the service of the kingdom, but we thank God for you and your service. God is the source of it all. 
You see, brothers and sisters, prayer is a whole lot more than us just asking things of God. We need to see prayer, prayer as a vehicle for communicating with our God, with our Father in heaven, for communing with Him, spending time with Him, speaking with Him. Have you ever prayed a prayer in which you only spent time praising and thanking God and nothing more, no requests? We often tend to pray, pray prayers with only requests and hardly any thanks or praise. Did you know that many of the Psalms are prayers to God which do exactly that? They just offer praise. They just offer thanks. Psalm 99 is one. Psalm 96, Psalm 100, Psalm 150. These are just straightforward declarations of praise. It's a calling upon God, so it's a prayer, but it's a calling upon God to praise, to magnify, to exalt, to glory in Him, to rejoice in Him, to let your heart sing in Him. That's all it's doing. We need to do that more. Then the rest of our lives will fall into better focus. And the rest of our needs will fall into their focus, the right focus. For that's the I of this acronym, ACTIP. The I is intercession. Intercession means to pray to God on behalf of other people. Daniel's prayer was a prayer of intercession for the whole nation of Israel. The Apostle Paul, in that passage we read, he too prays for the church at Colossa. Verse 9 of that chapter, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's intercession. I'm praying for you. What's Paul asking for? He's asking, above all else, that the Colossian Christians would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. That's worthy of thinking about too, isn't it? Why does he want the Colossian believers, why would I want the Ancaster believers to be filled with the knowledge of God's will? Well, he answers that for us in verse 10. So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing to him, bearing every bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. To summarize that, Paul prays for the church so that God's name would be glorified in them through their lifestyle, through their words, through their actions, bearing fruit in every good work, fully pleasing to God. He prays for their sanctification so that God may be praised. And Daniel's prayer, though he is certainly asking God to restore peace to Jerusalem and restore Israel to Jerusalem, he does so because he too is concerned for God's praise. Daniel says, verse 19, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Don't let your name be dragged down, Lord. Don't let the name of Jerusalem drag down your name and the ruin that Jerusalem is. Build up your people. Build up your city so that your name may be glorified. That's what Daniel's talking about. So brothers and sisters, when you make intercession for others people in your family, friends, brothers and sisters in the church, whoever, do so in the light of how the result, what the thing that you're asking for, how that will bring honor and praise to God's name. Lord, raise up the sick so that that sick person can take his or her place in their family again and, and be part of serving your, in your kingdom again to your glory. And the same goes with our own personal petitions. That's the P of ACTIP, the last letter. 
certainly we may make personal requests of God, things that I need, things that you need for yourself. But then, too, it must always be that we ask of God what we need so that we, in turn, can hallow, can praise, can honor his name. Our daily food, our daily shelter, work, education, breathing. It's not just to keep us alive. It's not just to keep us going. It is to keep us alive so that we, with our very life, can praise God, can live for his glory. That's why it's in the Lord's Prayer, these various requests. We pray that we might have what we need to live a holy life, to live a life worthy of the calling of God, as Paul says in Colossians, a life filled with and led by the Holy Spirit so that the Father in heaven is pleased when he looks upon his children, so that his name is honored among those who look upon their children, his children. A job, health, marriage, children, prosperity, all of these blessings are not ours by right, not at all. They're not ours merely for personal joy either. But we ask God for these blessings as he's promised them. So in receiving these blessings, we may use them to bring honor to his name. And you know, that's where the greatest joy comes from. Our joy and happiness is not the first goal. But when we bring glory to God, he fills our hearts with the joy and gladness. The the, the real joy and gladness of why we're on this earth Even as we saw in Acts chapter 2, this community filled with the Holy Spirit, sharing and caring. They're happy people. They're generous with each other and kind. They love it. Your prayers, my prayers, they will be on track to be heard by God when we connect our requests to the glory of our God. And through all of that, requests and praise, we have to always be mindful of our Savior, our Savior who perfects our prayers. Because you might be thinking right now, I don't know. Recipe for prayer that might get me in trouble. The right manner, the right words can make me apprehensive. What if I don't get it right? What if I mess up the recipe? What if I say something wrong to God, something stupid? Well, it's exactly then that we need to remember that we don't approach God of our own accord, nor do we approach God in heaven through our own merit. God does not hear our prayers on the basis of their good quality on the basis that we have all the right ingredients it will always be full of weakness our prayer it will always fall short of perfection it will always be tainted by sin rather we come to our father in heaven through our lord and savior jesus christ he is the only door into heaven through which we can enter And Jesus has the power to cleanse our prayers from their sins so that the Father receives them. Daniel already made note of that in his prayer. Verse 18. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, said Daniel. Oh, no. But because of your great mercy. Mercy. Daniel knew all about the mercy and compassion of God, his love toward his people, Israel, how he had chosen them to be his own, how he made a way for the forgiveness of their sins. God would hear Daniel's prayer because he himself had justified them in his mercy. And that justification of his people, it took place fully in the death of his son on the cross. It was in Christ that the Father paved the way for his people to come into his presence without fear of rejection, with their sins blotted out. The Catechism puts it this way, 
Answer 117. Third, we must rest on this firm foundation that although we do not deserve it, God will certainly hear my prayer, our prayer, for the sake of Christ our Lord, as he has promised in his word. God will certainly hear our prayer for Christ's sake. That's the critical thing. You know, God is very eager to answer our prayers. David, or rather Daniel, already knew how eager God is. He tells us in that chapter that an angel was sent to tell him something after he finished his prayer. Verse 23, the angel says to Daniel, at the beginning of your pleas for mercy, so at the start of your prayer, a word went out from God to angel, the angel Gabriel, and I have come to tell that word to you you, Daniel, you are greatly loved. Before Daniel even got the words of that prayer out of his mouth, the Father issued an answer. That's what he's saying here. The Father knew what he had asked, what he would ask, and he had an answer prepared. If it was that way already for Daniel who was waiting for the Lamb of God to come yet, can it be any different for us now that the Lamb of God has already come and has already been sacrificed for us and who now sits at the Father's right hand and purifies every prayer? No need to send Gabriel the angel because Jesus has already sent his Spirit the answer to our prayers is already on its way before you say amen. So pray from the heart. Pray according to God's scriptures, to the commands and promises. And pray always appealing to the blood of the Lamb. And then know that your prayers will always, always, always be heard and answered. Amen. Let's sing about that assurance in hymn 42.
Let us now profess and confess our Catholic undoubted faith together. We'll do that by singing the Apostles' Creed as it's put to music in hymn number two. Let us join together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, our Savior Jesus Christ, we acknowledge you to be God together with the Father and the Spirit. We want to worship you as our Savior too. We acknowledge that you are above all glory seated. You are the great king at your Father's right hand. You have death defeated. You have spoiled the grave so that its power, its sting is gone for those who belong to you. And Lord Jesus, you have gone up above. You have entered into eternal life as the first fruits of your Father's saving work, and you are the guarantee that we will follow after you. There in heaven, peoples from all the kingdoms of the earth adore you. The depths of hell 
below you tremble and know themselves to be defeated. So we, your people, O God, Lord and Savior, we implore your grace and love. Hear our prayers and help us ever seek the things that are above. Lord God, Lord Jesus, we thank you for the prayer you have taught us, that model prayer. We thank you for the whole scriptures, which are chock full of instruction on how we are to come to you in prayer. And Father, we thank you that you receive us through Christ, the great high priest. He is there in heaven doing his work continually, hearing our cries and bringing our cries to you, pleading with you, O Father, on our behalf. And so we know that our prayers, as imperfect as they are, are heard and are answered. Teach us, Father, more and more to pray in accordance with the instruction of Scripture from the heart, with humility, with content that matches the promises as well as the commands, pleading upon your promise to fulfill what you have committed to give, and also asking that your commands may be put into practice in our lives, that we would be enabled by your Spirit to obey your good and holy commands. And so bless us and build us up that we, your people, might shine in this dark world like stars in the universe. Lord in heaven, we pray for mission work all over the world. We think particularly of mission work among Jews, among the Muslims, and also other unbelievers scattered here and there. The Jews and the Muslims, they think highly of Abraham. They believe in one God. We plead with you, Father, show them that the one God is the triune God and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and is to be acknowledged as Savior, as the Holy One, the Righteous One. Bless all mission work to those ends and gather in your people from every tongue and tribe. Be with your people who experience oppression, persecution at the hands of unbelievers, in various countries, it can be severe. Lord, we pray for them, that you would uphold them, that they would remain faithful even to the end. And where we can help, even by sending funds or perhaps other things, where we can offer assistance, help us to do so. And Lord, protect your people, and may your kingdom come more and more on this earth. We thank you, Lord, for the peaceful election in our province of a few days ago and that the people of our land or our province could elect a majority government which will lead to stability over the next four years. But Father, more than anything, we, we ask that you would bless Premier Ford and his cabinet, that you would give them wisdom, that you would guide them so that they would rule in such a way as to honor the name of King Jesus he is the ultimate Lord of Lords, and to Him they will have to answer and help us to support them in finding that direction. Lord, we pray for all Christians who've been elected to the provincial legislature and those Christians who are working in the offices of the MPPs. Give grace and wisdom, and may their influence be felt. May they truly be light and salt in in that political realm which can be so filled with, with indeed much darkness. We pray that you would guide our nation more and more back to you. Lord, what seems impossible or unlikely from a human perspective, we know from your perspective all things are possible. And so we pray with boldness that your kingdom would come also here in Canada. We want to thank you, Father, for raising up three Brothers, this past week, who could become candidates for the ministry of the Word, we thank you that classes could see fit to pass these three brothers, and they are now ready to receive calls, and we pray that you would further open the way for them to receive a call. And for all other candidates that there might be, 
who could serve in your church as minister or missionary, bless them with a place and a calling. Lord, we need more servants, and we ask that you would send more young men who would give their lives in service of you in this particular way. We pray for members of our congregation who struggle with, with health or recovery from surgery. We have several such in our, in our midst. We ask, Lord, that you would help them deal with the pain, help them deal with physiotherapy, give them patience and endurance and healing. And for those who have other ailments, those who have struggles of the mind, those who are dealing with things of, of the heart, even anxiety or depression, all manner of ills befall us in this life. Father, we pray for help. We pray for encouragement. We pray for perseverance. We pray that you would lift us up from the doldrums and that you would help us all to have an eye for each other, that we would reach out to encourage and bless and help along as best we can. Go with us now into this coming week. May we finish this day of rest in a, a good and joyful and restful manner. And may we enter our work days tomorrow and beyond with renewed energy and zeal and a commitment to live in the joy of salvation, serving you with gladness of heart. All this we ask, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may bring your thank offering at this time. The offering will be received for the work of the deacons in the ministry of mercy. After that has been received, we will rise and praise our God with the words of Psalm 46, the stanzas 4 and 5.
receive the blessing of Jacob's God and go your way in his security. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.